of our final presentation this afternoon, uh, dealing with uh, the Mark Newby coinages of the New World, is by Roger Saboni and Vikan Yegparian. Now, Roger, who all of you know, as our distinguished uh, board member of the American Numismatic Society and vice president and a number of our committees. Roger has been a serious colonial numismatist for quite some time. He has a distinguished career in industry as uh, the chairman and uh, COO of KPMG and uh, president and uh, CEO of uh, Epiphany Incorporated. And he's done uh, some amazing things in the field of uh, cyber tech as well as in numismatics. Vicken, as a very distinguished young numismatist, I think of him as young, he was a student of mine some years ago, and uh, he was actually the new, young numismatist of the year quite a while ago, and then since become a graduate of Columbia and a participant in uh, former Coinage of the Americas conference and a uh, distinguished numismatist in the colonial field. Vicken, Roger? Five minutes? See if you can fix that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Before, um, before I start my presentation and we start talking about Mark Newby and debunking uh, some of the uh, myths uh, around Newby, I wanted to just debunk one myth around this conference. I've had many people graciously thank uh, myself and Oliver for putting together and managing this COAC. Um, my involvement in the COAC was Oliver I think it'd be a really cool idea if we did a COAC on St. Pat's. And that was about the end of it. Oliver took it from there. So really, I want to thank Oliver for doing all of this because he really worked behind the scenes. So now uh, turning to uh, Mark Newby. Uh, depending upon your point of view, Mark Newby is either the beginning of the story of St. Patrick's or the end of the story of St. Patrick's. Um, but uh, whatever your view is, it's uh, clear that the last documented uh, thread or trail in the St. Patrick Coinage saga uh, ends with uh, Mark Newby. Now, Mark Newby is um, someone who, at least over the years that I've been a colonial numismatist, is someone who we had kind of a shorthand knowledge about. Uh, most of American colonial numismatists tend to abbreviate their thinking about Newby as the London Quaker Tallow Chandler who moved to Dublin and ultimately to Western Jersey to escape religious persecution and start a life of Quaker simplicity. Uh, along the way, he, perhaps with others, at least as the story is sometimes told, managed to acquire a hoard of 14,400 St. Patrick halfpennies uh, that the small group of Quakers would use in their new settlement. Unfortunately, unfortunately, shortly after they were authorized, uh, Newby passes away and his poor widow was uh, made to redeem all of those St. Patrick uh, halfpennies uh, with the uh, remaining proceeds of his estate. Well, uh, as Vicken and I started to look into this, our research definitely indicated that Mark Newby did in fact travel from Ireland to Western Jersey to partially escape religious persecution, and he probably did bring with him coinage uh, for use in local commerce that we now talk of as St. Patrick coinage. Uh, but uh, from there on, all the stories about Mark Newby tend to be more apocryphal, we think, than real. Um, the story of uh, Mark Newby um, begins on February 25th, 1638, in the hamlet of Ersden in Northumberland, England, where Ralph and Dorothy Newby gave birth to their first son, Mark. The family ultimately moved to the county of Durham, where Ralph and Dorothy proceeded to have another son and daughter. In David Gladfelter, who's in the audience, a seminal article on uh, Mark Newby, and I, I really want to you know, encourage anybody that wants to uh, study Mark Newby and his activities in West Jersey to read David's article. In his article, he observes that George Fox, the founder of the Quaker movement, had begun proselytizing his new message, calling men to the eternal reward, inward realities, and to lives of unswerving devotion to the light around 1654 in both New Northumberland and Durham. Later that year, friends meetings were established in both counties, and it's about this time when uh, David and others speculate that Newby 
about 16 years old, is first exposed and possibly converts to Quakerism. Well, the trail of Mark Newby kind of dies there, but picks up again around a decade later when on May 26, 1663, he marries the landed widow Elizabeth Welsh, two years his senior in the county of Kilkenny near the village of Gowering. The couple proceeded to quickly have two children, Mary born in Kilkenny during February 64 and Joseph in Dublin during January 1665. Records suggest that the couple moved to Dublin in 1665 and remained there for over a decade. It was in Dublin that Newby set up shop as a merchant, a trade far more compatible with what we'll see his achievements were later in life than uh, one of uh, a candle maker. And although Newby went on to have three more children with Elizabeth and what was no doubt uh, a great personal tragedy and perhaps the beginning of him thinking that he needs to start a new life somewhere, uh, all three of his children pass away, or excuse me, all, all five of his children pass away, and in fact his wife Elizabeth also passes away and he buries her on June 22nd, 1672 in Dublin. And another occurrence, just a few months before his wife passes away, about eight months before Elizabeth dies, certainly also contributed to him thinking that, you know, I have to move somewhere, I have to find a new life. Um, he, he had a, another tragedy, and it was one that related to his beliefs as a Quaker. William Stockdale records, who was a... Um, a chronicler of the time, that in 1671, Mark Newby of Thomas Street, Dublin, because for conscience sake he could not be an observer of the holidays, he opened his shop on the 25th of the 10th month called Christmas Day. For this, he had his house assaulted by a rude multitude who with great violence threw dirt and stones into his shop, endangering his life and his family's, spoiled all his shop goods, broke glass windows and pewter vessels, abused their neighbors for reproving them. The said Mark Newby was damnified. Well, despite this experience and the passing of his children and wife, Newby did remain in Dublin for at least a short period, and on March 24, 1674, embarked on his second marriage to Hannah Holmes. On February 14, 1675, they had their first child, Rachel, who was also born in Dublin. While it's not known whether Newby or his family personally faced ongoing persecution, fines, or even imprisonment for his faith, it is clear that thousands of other Quakers throughout England and Ireland did. So no doubt shortly after his marriage to Hannah, he must have moved his family to the county of Wicklow where, he, where a growing society of friends was emerging. It is here somewhere between 1675 and 1681, and we believe closer to 1681, that Newby meets William Bates in the Balakine meeting of friends. Bates, another devout Quaker, experienced even greater persecution and punishment than befell Newby. Bates was actually fined and imprisoned for pursuing his Quaker beliefs. Bates' experience led him to join a group of leading local Quakers who were pursuing the establishment of a new settlement in western Jersey. This plan had been in the making for some time, but either Newby was persuaded to join or more likely Newby negotiated his way to join the expedition at around this time. As Gladfelter pieces together, there is a continuous stream of documentation that places Newby in or near Dublin in the trade of a merchant from 1663 to as late as 1681. The notion of Newby being a London tallow chandler or a candle maker appears to start with John Clement's book, The First Emigrant Settlers into Newton Township, in which he devotes a full chapter to Mark Newby. Gladfelter speculates that this error had its origin in Clement somehow confusing the word Barbican for Balakane in Newby's removal certificate issued by the Balakane Friends Meeting, a document that would serve as a letter of introduction to the Friends in West Jersey that he was ultimately going to emigrate to. Clement evidently assumed that the meeting was on Barbican Street in London, although it's not clear how he made the leap to a tallow chandler as well. 
Whether this was the source of the confusion or not, and with all due respect to the vocation of being a candle maker, it appears that the resources required, as well as the business and political acumen that were employed by Mark Newby in planning, financing, uh, and ultimately being a significant member of the voyage to Western Jersey, were beyond anything a candle maker, let alone even a successful merchant, could have easily accomplished. From all indications, it appears that Newby's decision to emigrate with his family from County Wicklow to Western Jersey was motivated by the desire to pursue religious freedom and avoid the persecution he faced being back in Dublin and continuing on with the injustices faced by he and his friends locally. Indeed, given his and Bates' experience, it's no wonder that they ended up partnering in a voyage together. However, it must be recognized that one of the motives of these settlers was also to reap a profit in their enterprise. And certainly for me, one of the uh, more enlightening things I found in this process was that I had a changing view of Newby, of being first a, a man who was really focused on uh, pursuing religious freedom, a modest man, a simple man, ultimately going to Western Jersey, to actually someone who was quite an enterprising entrepreneur. And it was not only him, but really the, the bulk of the Quakers that embarked on this journey were quite enterprising. R.G. Johnson, the first historian from Fenwick Colony, which was amongst the first colonies that were formed as part of the William Penn Group in establishing Western Jersey, observed in the history of Salem County, New Jersey, that, quote, they were every one of them speculators in these Western lands, and their sole object was to accumulate fortunes. Although they were all men of high character and distinction, it must be apparent to every observer that self-interest was at the bottom of all their schemes and maneuvers. Reed and Miller in the Burlington County Court Book of West Jersey uh, that talks about activities of the court from 1680 to 1709 go on to comment that the spiritual and material prosperity for Quakers went hand in hand. For if the individual Quakers did not prosper, their, their society of friends could not either. Certainly, Newby was no exception to this rule. In fact, as we assess the actions of Newby leading up to his departure and his activities once they arrived in western New Jersey, he may have been one of the principal beneficiaries of the new settlement, even though he only lived for a few short years after his arrival. Given that Newby was a merchant in Dublin, he undoubtedly experienced the shortage of small change that periodically occurred in Ireland during his residence there. As such, he was keenly aware of the difficulty of conducting day-to-day -day commerce in a hard money vacuum. He also probably had a sense of the value of good metal versus bad, and what traded freely and perhaps what traded at a discount. And finally, what might be required to help affect exchange in a new settlement. So it's not surprising that he, amongst all the voyagers of Ye Owner's Adventure, which was the ship that they ultimately set sail to Western Jersey on, was the one to anticipate the need for coinage and also be the one best positioned to be aware of a hoard of copper tokens in hiding that could be from, as we've seen today, the era of Charles I, or could have been Dublin merchant tokens, or could have been demonetized money. Either way, he had the sense uh, to be aware and the opportunity to acquire good copper at a discount um, in one of these manners. Each theory has been hypo hypothesized as to how he came by this money, but it may have been just as simple as having had the local business information as to where, um, where these uh, the small coinage might be obtained in quantity at a discount. Whatever the circumstances are, they must have been acquired at a favorable enough price that he could purchase them, his land in Newton, in western Jersey, and passage for he and his family, at the same time disregard, as we talked about earlier, what probably was repugnant Catholic and monarchical iconography of the St. Patrick coinage. It's also likely that well before departing, and most likely even before he actually went ahead and purchased these St. Patrick uh, coinage, whether they be farthing or halfpenny, which Vickham will talk about, 
He probably negotiated with his fellow voyagers something along the lines of a discussion that we're going to need money where we're going, and how about I take the lead on acquiring this coinage, and if you all agree with me, I'll work to get them uh, established as the coinage of the realm. So um, whatever, whatever the circumstances were around how we acquired them, I think this was kind of the first uh, bit of enterprising spirit that we uh, see um, for profit making in the new venture. Uh, and finally, and I wanna again dispel another myth that I've heard people talk about. While some people have speculated that he was acting in concert with others in bringing these St. Patrick's to the new world, uh, as we'll see in the discussion I'm about to go through, it's highly unlikely that he would have been in partnership with others to acquire these coinage and have them uh, have them established as a coin of the realm in western New Jersey and let his estate, he and his estate stand behind them if he was acting in concert with others. So let's move now to the formation of western Jersey itself because this is another interesting uh, segment in the evolution of the coinage, what he brought, how much he brought. Um, when we look at the formation of western Jersey, from 1674 to 1683, while Newby and his fellow Quakers in Dublin were slowly developing this realization that their only hope for religious freedom and perhaps economic prosperity lay in the new world of North America, Lords Berkeley and Carteret, along with several other influential Quakers, including John Fenwick, William Penn, Gowan Lowry, and Nicholas Lucas, were sorting through a complex set of deeds, patents, rights of proprietorship to create a land stock company consisting of approximately 4,600 square miles of land which represented Western Jersey. The land company was capitalized with 100 shares of stock. 10 shares of that stock went to Fenwick, who was one of the people that was really working kind of initially and behind the scenes even before William Penn to form Western Jersey. Uh, he was awarded 10 shares for his uh, activities in the formation of this land stock company. The remaining 90 shares were offered for sale at 350 pounds a share. Over time, virtually all of the shares were purchased by Quakers. Of the entire group of purchasers, 100 were English, 17 were Irish, and three were Scots. Six of the Irish proprietors settled in Newton Creek. It is from this group that Newby acquired a 120th interest in one of these shares, or 1,472 acres. Though Newby, as we will see, appears to have been one of the more enterprising and ambitious of the new voyagers to Western Jersey, it appeared that he was among the last to the venture and perhaps was only induced or included uh, in the venture by his association with William Bates. Pomfret writes that the Irish proprietors were well known to one another and had made plans to undertake a separate settlement as early as September 1677, when an agreement was made between Anthony Sharp, William Clark, Matthias Foster, Roger Roberts, and Richard Hunter, excuse me, and Thomas Atherton and Thomas Starkey, uh, where they came together, purchased stock in the land company, and agreed that they would undertake a voyage to Western Jersey to, de to develop the property. This group so soon joined another group, one of Robert Turner, Joseph Slay, Robert Zane, Thomas Thackeray, and William Bates. You see nowhere in this Mark Newby. It was this combined group, these two partnerships in uh, the shares of stock in the land company, that combined began to discuss their plans and in turn decided to delegate yet another group, Thackeray, Bate, Thomas Sharp, who was Anthony Sharp's nephew, George Goldsmith, and for the first time, Mark Newby to establish a colony. Zane preceded the expedition in order to scout out the land and was in constant correspondence with Robert Turner who was given the major credit for organizing and financing the undertaking. I know that some people have talked about uh, Sharp being the, the money man behind the scenes and the real brains behind the operation, but from what we can tell, it was truly Turner. 
The delegated group of Quakers that included Newby set sail for Western Jersey on September 19, 1681 on Yeoner's Adventure and arrived in Salem in November of 1681. And let's see. So they initially arrived here in Salem. And uh, they arrived, I think, at the winter, spent the winter in Salem. And apparently, fortunately for them, it was actually a, a pretty mild winter. And that following spring, they migrated up to Gloucester County and settled in Newton Township. And in the center of Newton Township was where Mark Newby settled his home and established his first portion of the 120th interest, 350 acres, to establish his household. Now we know from contemporaneous written records uh, in the various minutes, reports, and acts of the General Free Assembly of Western Jersey that once in Newton Township, Newby quickly established himself as a leader amongst the settlers in the matters of both faith and government and economics. Thomas Sharp writes that immediately after arrival into Newton Township, there was a meeting set up and kept at the house of Mark Newby, and in a short time it grew and increased. This represented the first friends meeting in Gloucester County and after Salem and Burlington, the third in Western Jersey. At the same time, we see Newby, Newby deeply involving himself, not only at the same, excuse me, at the same time we see Newby, Newby establishing himself as a leader in faith, we see him involving himself in both the government and matters of basic finance and commerce in West Jersey. Newby was elected to the second session of the General Free Assembly of West Jersey, which met on May 2nd through 6th in 1682. He no doubt had worked hard and carefully behind the scenes from probably as early as the days of the initial voyage formation back in County Wicklow to see the following legislation passed during the same session. And in that session, the following act was passed. And for the more convenient payment of small sums, be it enacted by the authority aforesaid that Mark Newby halfpence shall pass for halfpence current pay of this province, provided that he, the said Mark, give sufficient security to the Speaker of this House for the use of the General Assembly from time to time being. Goes on to say that he, the said Mark Newby, his, his executors and his administrators shall and will change the halfpence for pay equivalent upon demand and provided also that no person or persons be hereby obligated to take more than five shillings in one payment. So I just want to just focus on a few important points uh, uh, with respect to this act of the West Assembly, West Jersey Assembly. Uh, the first thing is, it is remarkable how Mark Newby apparently last to the game finds himself elected to the assembly and has the wheels or uh, whatever you want to say greased such that everybody agrees that his coin is going to be coin of the realm. And at the same time, in the same session, the West Jersey Assembly renounced an act they had passed at the previous session where they were willing to accept British regal coinage at highly inflated rates. So he manages to position himself from last in the game to the guy who gets his coinage, the St. Patrick coinage, monetized. The second thing I want to point out is that, and this is where a lot of people, I think, have, have gotten things a bit confused, it only says that he will collateralize the coinage with something that the speaker finds adequate, and that if called upon, he will, he or his heirs will uh, redeem the coinage, but not that he shall absolutely redeem the coinage if he dies or whatever. Now, 
I want to turn to the next kind of uh, interesting thing that uh, at least I always believed up until recently about, uh, about uh, St. Patrick's in West Jersey. And that is that it's been accepted as frankly common wisdom for many years that the number of newbie half pennies put into circulation by this act was at least 14,400 because this is the amount that Frank Stewart in his book, The First Banker of New Jersey, reckoned were redeemed by his estate approximately two years later when he died. However, as we will see, the supposed redemption probably never really occurred. And in fact, since we know the security he was ultimately asked to provide for the coinage, let's see where the math is. Did I go back? How do I do this go back? There we go. Next one. Okay. It was. A, we were to see the supposed redemption probably never really occurred. And in fact, since we know that the security was asked to ultimately provide what, for the coinage was 300 acres of land, the 14,400 number seems even more improbable. Newby's 2.3 square mile parcel of land, which represented the 1,472 acres, was paid for by Newby with 17.5 pounds. Therefore, basically, he bought uh, his 300 acres that he ultimately used to collateralize the Newby half pence with, with 3.57 pounds. So, you take the 17.5 pounds he paid for the 300, divide it by 1760, that gives you the 3.57 3 pounds for the 300 acres collateralization. Now, if that was the required collateralization for the newbie half pennies, and uh, as we know, there were 20 shillings to the pound and 24 half pennies to the shilling, that translates to 1,713 half pennies. Now, um, even if we assume that there was some appreciation or that rather than putting up 100% collateral, which given my understanding of how Quakers did business as I've become more uh, attuned to, it's unlikely, but let's just say that even if he was only required to put up 50% collateralization, we're still talking about something like 2,500 half pennies, or let's call it newbie half pennies, at the absolute maximum. And if you, stay, if you take a step back and just realize that at this time, West Jersey was practic practically uninhabited and that there were at most several dozen families, 2,500 half pennies was surely enough to satisfy their needs for commerce and 14,400 might be a bit of an overkill. So where does this uh, apocryphal 30 pounds that was redeemed by the estate or 14,400 half pennies emerge from that Stuart writes about? Well, there doesn't seem to be any way to tell with absolute certainty. If you look at the Stewart book, he just makes the statement, no footnote, no support uh, around it. But it appears that he relied heavily on uh, a book by Clements, who first discusses the financial affairs of the settlement and of Mark Newby's widow in 1877. Clement was the one that uh, dug up the records that found the estate and the assets of uh, Newby. It appears that Frank Stewart made an unwarranted inductive leap in his monograph on Newby because Clement described on page 40 of his book that when a settlement was made between the, administrat the administratrix and the commission upon Newby's death, that there was a deficiency of 30 pounds discovered in the, quote, banking operations of Newby. Now, you have to take a step back here and just think about what Newby was involved in. He was involved in the West Jersey Assembly. He was involved in getting these uh, St. Patrick 
coinage, whether they be half pennies or farthings, circulated. He was involved in land and land allocation. A lot of the financial toing and froing of the new settlement all went through Newby. So when he did pass away just two years after he arrived, uh, it's no doubt that he had a complex set of books of debits and credits. And it's no doubt that when the West Jersey Assembly and the Secretary were settling up with him, that there would be a deficiency which uh, the widow newbie, Hannah, would have had to settle. But uh, settling a 30 pound deficiency on a set of books and a reconciliation of accounts is a far cry from the formal redemption of coinage. And the only other thing that we can think of that might have confused Stuart was that when, when Mark Newby's uh, widow did settle the estate, did sort out the affairs uh, between the estate and um, the uh, West Jersey Assembly, uh, and did make the settlement payment, they were kind enough to release the land that had previously secured the coinage so that she could pass it on to Newby's son, Edward. So, um, as we kind of look to the next phase in the 30 pound figure, we can also begin to kind of make some practical assumptions about what would have happened and whether that number was just too convenient as another way of looking at this, and I'll turn it to Vicken to kind of commence at this section. Vicken? Thank you, Robert. Well, so when we first started looking into this, into the whole Mark Newby involvement in, in this enterprise, and this 30 pounds converted to the 14,400 uh, half pence figure, everything seemed too round, that, that pound figure seemed too round. And as we, as Roger noted, as we looked deeper and deeper, we, we realized that Stewart had just uh, interpreted or misinterpreted uh, the various secondary sources that, that he was using and some primary sources over time. And uh, he, he cites certain documents very clearly, but doesn't give a clear citation for for where he got that 30 pound figure. And as, as Roger mentioned, it goes, goes back to John Clement, who was one of the first uh, historians of, of his locality. Uh, he, he lived in Newton Township, I believe, and was one, from one of the old families there. And he, he, was, uh, he was a judge and he knew many, he knew how to read the, the old deeds and documents, et cetera, that, that he had found. And uh, he writes, and, I, and we quote, uh, the history of the bank, referring to Newby's halfpence operation, may be readily followed through the records of those days, and enough gathered to show its beginning, progress, and end. As security to the people of the province, as Roger had mentioned, and as required by law, Mark Newby conveyed to Samuel Jennings, who was, I believe, the governor of the province at that time, and Thomas Budd, as commissioners, a tract of land in Newton Township containing 300 acres, located by the said Mark. When the settlement was made between the administratrix and the commissioners, a deficiency of 30 pounds was discovered in the banking operations, which was, however, made good out of his personal estate, thus releasing the land bef as before named. And this, Roger had mentioned this, and the only documents that we were able to find supporting that, it, it uses much vaguer language uh, that just for a consideration paid out of the estate of said Mark Newby, this 300 acres of land was, was released uh, in trust to, to these commissioners of, of the West Jersey Assembly, uh, held in trust for, for uh, Mark's son, Edward. So we believe that John Clement's writing in 1877 is the earliest reference to this 30 pound discrepancy for which we have not seen or lo located any, any discrete source documents, assuming they still exist in 2006 as they did in 1877. Clement turns Newby's issuance of these dirty little coppers into a banking operation, and I put that in quotes. I claim that we, as did David Gladfelter in 1974, uh, countenance with some circumspection. Newby, Newby was filling a simple need for small change and guaranteeing its re redemption. There is no evidence that he was taking deposits with promises to pay on demand, or that he was issuing loans or that, or that he was performing any other functions that we would consider banking today or even then. 
Much has been made of the fact that Newby operated the quote unquote first bank in New Jersey. However, Thomas Budd, one of Newby's contemporaries, writing in 1685, just a few, a few years after Mark Newby's death, proposes that West Jersey set up a bank, in fact, issuing loans with land as a guarantee, as a means of growing the, the, the infant economy of West New Jersey. Albeit a short monograph, Bud's text does not mention that there ever was a bank in, in West Jersey, or that a man named Newby ever operated one in that colony. This we find strange, given that both Bud and Newby served in the same sessions of the General Free Assembly of West New Jersey. He must have known if, if Newby was, was, uh, was banking and, and he would have wanted to continue that operation. Uh, we hope to find some of the original sources to which Clement refers when he states that, quote, the history of the bank may be readily followed through the records of those days. Uh, these records might be just transactions of everything was centered around land, it seems, in, in this nation, econ uh, nation economy, uh, buying, selling, trading. Um, so perhaps it might just be in, in, in these land deeds and, and the, the records are split into m many different sources. Uh, hopefully these documents, if they still exist, will yield the true interpretation of Newby's accounts vis-a-vis -vis his halfpence. From just a practical point of view, uh, given the virtual starvation for coinage in, in all of western New Jersey, let alone the, the small locality of Newton Township where Newby lived, it seems highly unlikely that after having had the St. Patrick coinage introduced into circulation, perhaps just a year later, people would be standing in line to redeem everything that Newby had issued. This was a scarce commodity that, that, that people just wouldn't have given up very quickly and very lightly. Uh, just a few short years later, in 1686, the first taxes in Old Gloucester County were payable in, in cereals and skins due to the utter scarcity of currency. The coins undoubtedly became more and more dispersed as they circulated more widely among the small yet growing population of West New Jersey. Now, as numismatists, we can look at the look at some of the historiography and 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 some of the the history of Mark Newby and his peers, but at base level, we're interested, which are these Patrick halfpence? And this is something that, that Phil started going into uh, in, his, in his discussion earlier today. Despite the clear reference in the assembly, in the West New Jersey Assembly's Act of May 1682 to these quote unquote Patrick halfpence, the true identity of Newby's coins has remained a mystery due to the existence of the two sizes of St. Patrick's coins. Now, just looking at some of the, the find evidence, which, which uh, Phil had also discussed, as, as, early as, as, as early as 1845, Isaac Mickle, who is also a, a local Gloucester County, Newton Township native, uh, states that, quote, Newby lived on the farm now owned by that successful collector of coins, Joseph B. Co Cooper, Esquire, in Newton, where many of the Patrick halfpence have been plowed up. To our knowledge, these coins have not been discovered by the numismatic community, if they still exist. Um, um, this gentleman, Isaac Mickle, had called him a, a great collector, and I had actually asked uh, P. Scott Rubin to see if this name had rung any bells with him, if, if, if his coins had ever come up for auction in the 19th century or something, and he, he himself drew a blank, so he must have just, uh, his, his collecting must have been only of local uh, renown. Uh, if these coins were found, being uh, these coins that Joseph Cooper had plowed up on, on his farm, they would provide a welcome, welcome support to the true identity of Newby's halfpence. New Jersey Copper's researcher Maris wrote that, that Newby halfpence could still be found circulating in the local area into the early 19th century. Uh, we don't know what Maris's sources, if they were, were they written or oral, but we do know that Maris knew the existence of the two sizes, but he did not differentiate necessarily, uh, didn't take into consideration the, the, whether if, if it was actually the half penny or if the, the farthing was being passed as, the smaller size denomination was being passed as a, as a half penny. But perhaps most telling is, is the information that, that Phil provided earlier is the, is the find, the single find evidence that he had listed in his, that the five of the, the small size, the quote unquote farthing size pieces were found. Six, 
Six pieces? I, I thought you listed one of them as a silver piece. No, there were two of them Oh, the Gloucester and Monmouth ones? Yeah. yeah. So there were six pieces found, and, and evidently none of the, the larger module ones as yet. Um, and another thing to consider is that in, uh, in May of 1681, the commissioners of West New Jersey uh, gave the Burlington Court, which was a, uh, just a local court set up to deal with uh, problems. The Quakers often settled uh, differences amongst themselves, and it was very rare that that uh, uh, that disputes would be taken to the court. But the the court actually had legislative abilities too at that at that very early point in in the government of West New Jersey. They passed a regulation, or they legislated uh, a regulation uh, of the rates at which English coins should pass. It was decided that quote the king's copper farthing should pass at a half penny and the halfpence at one penny. Whether these rates, as were the cried up rates, which, which uh, Roger mentioned before, the English, they had repealed an act that, that had cried up the English shilling to, to act as 18 pence and, and the New England coinage, uh, New, Eng New England shilling would pass at 14 pence. That was repealed when, when Mark Newby had gotten his halfpence authorized. We're not sure if this this crying up of the farthing to the to the halfpenny denomination was still in effect when 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 newbies uh, coins were authorized. So it's possible that that what might have been a farthing was actually circulating as a halfpenny. Um, Of course, uh, we may never know the true identity of newbies halfpence, whether, whether they were the small or the large module coins. As a token coinage whose intrinsic value was outstripped by its face value, as Phil demonstrated, it is also possible that both small and large module St. Patrick's coinages circulated side by side as these halfpence, with no differentiation of denomination. Perhaps anything, and using a, a favorite uh, turn of phrase of Rogers, anything brown and round would have passed muster in this cash-starved economy. But no matter what denomination or size went to New Jersey, we do not know what happened to these coins. If the published documents of Newby's, in the published documents of Newby's estate, there is no mention of any leftovers or unissued pieces. Could they have been dispersed could, could he have dispersed his whole supply in the one year between the authorization of, of Newby's halfpence and his death about a year, a year and a half later? Perhaps, but um, me and Roger hope to do some more digging and, and perhaps find uh, the true nature of these Newby's halfpence. Thank you. redeem them in nothing. Uh, so, so, so basically, I would, you, know, you, you could use that as a further argument to support your point. You know, it's interesting if you take that back to the listing of his estate, he has, you know, various sundry products that range from, you know, metal to tools to oxen, oxes, power. cereal. You know, it's it just hard to fathom a situation where all of a sudden, they finally get this coin that they're star this coinage that they're starving for, and he dies, and all and everybody kind of comes to the widow newbie standing in line saying, "Okay, I've got eight half pennies. I'd like to have a box of uh, grain." And someone else says, "I have two hundred. I would like uh, a third of your ox, uh, or, or so forth." So, you know, it just it just defies logic that that upon his death that people who finally got what they were looking for um, would uh, suddenly turn around and redeem them. The other thing that, that is you begin to play out this whole scenario of Newby being last in the game, being a merchant, figuring out that they're gonna need coinage. And probably after he had that experience with his shop being stoned and so forth, and he moves to County Wicklow and spends a short period of there. He's not ha he doesn't have a lot of capital to invest in this new venture. 
and I think in a very enterprising way, saw an opportunity to buy what I believe probably was demonetized farthing, you know, at a bulk rate for almost nothing and organize in advance a way to immediately arbitrage it, use some of that potential gain to pay for his land, and all of a sudden find himself both a banker, a financier, a government official, and a landowner in a very short period of time. You know, that, that's sort of interesting because uh, Pennsylvania started land banks, and this is precisely what he was doing. Well, he didn't have paper money. He had hard money. I mean, hard coin. He was bas basically making a land bank out of it. If, if you sit back and think about how this might have happened, too, you, you can see a group of, uh, Sharp and his crowd were a wealthier group of Quakers. Newby was probably, if you just kind of look at the various players, probably one of the less financially successful of the group. Uh, probably one of the less finan financially successful of the group. And I can almost envision a scenario where part of the reason why they agreed to let him do this was to allow him to build up some capital to immigrate with them. Uh, but um, it's just amazing to me how quickly he rose from kind of the, the last guy to the party to the leader of the group. Uh, Sid and then Dave. Yeah, is there anyone, has anyone made any kind of an attempt to figure out of the entire St. Patrick's coinage, how, what percentage of that Mark Newby bought? Do we have any clue at all? You, you know, it's, it's so hard. And, and you know what I think makes it even harder, and I've thought about this question, Sid, is that we can't, you know, one of the problems I had with 14,000, or we had with 14,400 was, that's a fair amount of coinage to end up in one person's estate and then just disappear. You would have thought there would have been a hell of a lot more if one person had it, that somehow it would have evolved. And I think the smaller number is consistent with what we see in the way of St. Patrick's today. And I would say that of the St. Patrick's today, that the lion's share didn't come from West, West New Jersey. The lion's share came over from Ireland. So you really have the small corpus of, let's call it anywhere from 1750 to 2500, that gives rise to our fascination by it and us sucking all these St. Patrick's over here from Ireland to the U.S. as a collectible. It's kind of a fascinating saga, but who knows how many it was from. I think the most telling thing is the land collateralization. I mean... Short of us finding newbies ledger books or something, I don't think that he was operating a land bank for the reason that I said someone a few years later is suggesting that a land bank be created in order to to make the colony grow quicker and quicker. I think he just was issuing them. They wanted to make sure that he would have the money to, to redeem them if, if and when the time came. And that's when the commissioners of the, of the West Jersey Assembly said, hey, you need to give us some land as, as, a, as a surety, as a bond against this issue of happening. So I don't think a land bank was created. Right. Well, my, point was, my point was, but it's sort of a very primitive concept of the land bank. Maybe. Yeah, I, I think this, I actually, I think that's right. I mean, this is a, a primitive concept of a land bank because if you look at Newby's 1,475 acres, he was given, and this is another way you can tell he was last to the party because he had a 120th interest in a share that was already subdivided twice by other groups of Quakers that were contemplating this voyage. And what he got outright was 350 acres to, 350 acres to settle on. He was given a one-fifth interest in about 1,600 acres that some of the other late to the game settlers got. And the rest was due to him over time. On, on one of the earlier slides, there was, uh, I think, 46,000 acres is what they kind of anticipated earlier, as I understand it. Though that was divided into 100, and then 
as they surveyed out that 46, uh, 46,000 acres. Miles, if, square miles. Or square miles, I'm sorry. If there was more land, for, they were starting at the Delaware River and going inland. If there was more land in West Jersey left over than, than those fractional, uh, according to what share you bought, would go to you uh, of, of future lands that are surveyed. David Gladwell. Excuse me. Uh, that is that. Uh, uh, I mean, the twenty-five hundred seems uh, plenty to to meet the needs, the foreseeable needs of the new colony. But uh, you have at least that many uh, or more that are now in numismatic hands. If you're saying that the, <laughs> that what we call the halfpence are our fours and the farthings are our ones, so clearly uh, most of them probably came over. From yeah, it's remarkable, even even before our more current fascination, because certainly, as we were talking earlier, I can remember a well-known colonial dealer begging me to buy uh, these beautiful St. Patrick's out of the Norweb sale, you know, that he had bought. And I'm just going, uh, you know, that's stuff. But but clearly today we have we have sucked over demand. I'd be curious what uh, Robert uh, has to say about uh, the Americans he left about the Americans uh, uh, demanding over the St. Pat's. So, quit. Yes. Will. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, one, is there anything to be made of this five shilling limit on how many uh, a person would have to accept? I mean, is there any sort of standard for the supply versus the number that, that a person would have to accept? I think the box that we just to not stick any one person with more than this isn't this isn't uh, there's no intrinsic value there's no intrinsic value to these to these essentially token coinages so if someone had more than that they'd be opening themselves up to uh, a, a huge loss if suddenly Mark Newby died or the West Jersey Assembly dissipated or all these authorizing backers uh, of of the coinage whereas if you have a, a a gold piece or a silver piece, at worst, if, if the spread between the, the face and the intrinsic value, that would be the extent of your loss. So whether whether there were a lot more that, that did come, and that's why there was five shillings is 120, pe 120, yeah, 120 pieces. Uh, whether there were more that came, again, is open to speculation. You can choose 1,700, 2,500, 14,400, or, or if there are 450 dye varieties supposedly of the farthings, correct? Is that what Stan Stevens says? Uh, no, I, I think there's... Uh, 180? I think there's separate dyes, but that translates to several hundred varieties, but it, whatever it is. I, I, I want to add one point to Will. I actually have seen a couple of situations, and I'm trying to conjure them up as we're thinking here, where there has been, uh, let's call it coinage of fiat in the colonies where they say that it is legislated that something will become coinage and they put limits on how much anybody would have to accept in any one case. I think that's the case for New Jersey coppers as I'm sitting here thinking about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think there's a long tradition of that. But, but what I meant was, is there any standard ratio of the supplies to not, not no. well, the, the other question I think that the law says that um, the, the West Jersey law says that uh, it's 300 land uh, acres of land in sec as security. security is security necessarily collateral or could that be like a surety bond or just some amount of land that would be painful for newbie to have forfeited you know I thought about that whether you know it was whether it was inflicting pain or not, but it just seemed like land was too, land was too plentiful. Newby had a, a fair amount of it. Uh, I think that it was probably more collateral than a surety. And in fact, they refer to it as collateral as opposed to a surety. They, they call it security, I think. Sure. Yeah, so I would view it as collateral as opposed to a surety. I don't think it was stipulated in the legislation what it would be. I think the land was used as uh, as surety, that's what Newby offered to the commissioner. No, but to your point, it was surety. Surety? Yeah. yeah. It's a. Uh, I think the law says security. I, I think it security, says. I think it yeah, says security. Yeah, that's what I thought. So sorry. security to me is collateral. Surety is pain. 
So, just time. Is there one more? Yes. Did you be on this board in which these pieces would be accepted in the normal course of business? And was that the, that was that the intention when they talked about redeeming these pieces? Was it just meant to be sent to the store? Can, can you can you repeat can you repeat it one more time? Sure. Um, would, would the newbie own a store at which these pieces were to be spent in the normal course of business? And was that what they meant by redeeming the pieces? How he how he got them exactly into circulation, you know, is unclear. I don't. I think he gave up the craft of being a merchant and became. Uh, kind of a minor speculator, government official, arbitrager. He only lived uh, two more years and passed away, but the, the number of achievements that he had, he was elected to the assembly, he was authorized to put these coins in circulation, he was in charge of the land commission. He was uh, for laying out and distributing lands in, on that commission. He was elected, I think there were two councillors from from each session or from each uh, each major division of, of New Jersey at that time, who were a counselor was a advisor to the governor, so he, he he rose up. But I think as I don't know if he had a store, it's not clear. He, he came as a merchant, but if you look at his estate, there's a lot of farming implements there. If you read the various history books uh, talking about the people who were who were these first immigrants to Western New Jersey by by nature, by by just the land, they became farmers uh, at some level. You know, I think if you, what I think is interesting is his decade-long experience as a merchant probably served him incredibly well in this whole venture. You know, first in terms of anticipating that they may need coinage for this. Secondly, in terms of I'm sure his decade as a merchant gave him the knowledge of where to go to find these, you know, St. Patrick, let's call them coinage, whatever they were, uh, probably at a steep discount. The ability to position himself uh, to distribute them and so forth. I mean, I, I think he was quite an entrepreneur. And I, I walked into this thinking about him as a humble, you know, you know, God-fearing Quaker who just, you know, traveled over on this treacherous journey, you know, to get religious freedom. And I walked away thinking, this guy was one hell of an entrepreneur, you know. So he was one of our, our, our first real wheeler dealer businessmen, and at least in my thinking about him. Since the uh, smaller coin is a different alloy than the larger one. Potentially, yes. potentially. Okay, potentially, but let's say they corrode differently, so there's something to that, perhaps. Anything that Phil says, there's something to. <laughs> how, how do we know they were made by the same person, even, or at the same time, the small one versus the large one? Don't. Uh, just now we're into beliefs and sitting here talking. I don't believe they were made by the same person at the same time at all. Well, I'm glad we got that out. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I mean, I. It looks like to me, just looking at a lot of coins made by made at different times, whether by different people, I don't know. As um, as as Oliver was pointing out, there are you know, stylistic differences between the, the two coins, but the, the metallic differences. The metallic differences. Two different times, yes. Two different people. Who know. What, what's the ratio of rarity from one to the other? That's well, well, and, and well, there there are. It depends on how you approach it. There are considerably more farthings than there are half pennies, considerably. But then within farthings, depending upon who you believe and how you interpret these small coinage, uh, I think that every single St. Patrick, I think the most common is an R5. And most of them are R6s and 7s. But there is no R5, it's all R6s and 7s. You're talking about variety. Yes, yeah, so the the, the push the varieties aside. So in absolute numbers, ten to one. More than that. Twenty to one. Ten to one. No, much. I I'd say. I'd say eight to one. 
I don't think it's 50 to 1. Gosh, I, I would think more like 20 to 1, just, but yeah. it's just different. You know, I, say, I, I, I always look at things as opportunities to acquire. I've had hundreds of opportunities to acquire farthings. I've had fewer opportunities to acquire half pennies. Uh, and you, you deal with you deal with yeah, them. So I'm just trying to picture them in, in auction catalogs. How many how many half pennies are there? Half quote unquote. How many larges versus smalls? As a, as an old time collector who's not very serious in the series, I've just come not run across half pennies or big. Yeah. So I have, a, I have an interesting statistic here. Uh, That's what we're talking, and now we're at kind of the BSing part of the, the session, I guess. Um, how many how many half pennies were in Ford? Uh, I want to say ten. Yeah, eight. I think about ten. Was there eight or ten? Said you, eight or ten half pennies in Ford. There were no farthings. Now, for a lot of reasons, I don't want to get into. I do know that Boyd sold all of his farthings in a single transaction to an individual, and I believe it was 120. So there's one, you know, FCC Boyd, who could have been, you know, in the, in the uh, 20th century, probably the most prolific collector around uh, 10 to 120. 